So before we do this, it will make sense to define a constant, and specifically the Rydberg constant. And this is R or R naught is kind of how we typically see it written. And R naught, um, it, it's a bit of a funky way to write it, but it turns out it's, it's actually the most, uh, the most convenient way to write it. It equals 0 0.110 nanometers, and that's all raised to the negative first. So the units for R naught are actually inverse nanometers. So clearly at some point along the way, when we use this constant, we're going to need to invert this to actually properly predict the wavelengths. Uh, you'll see how that's incorporated though. So this is, again, it's just a, a numerically measured constant that it's, you know, just trial and error. You just try to try different values until they fit all three of these series. So let's start with the Lyman series here. In order to predict the wavelengths emitted by the Lyman series, uh, I'm just going to write this down without motivating why it is what it is, because that's exactly what you're doing on your next homework set. But the exact uh, formula that predicts the Lyman series is this. 1 over the wavelength. So there's going to be a series of each of these. The inverse of each wavelength in the Lyman series is given by R not, and, and that's good by the way, so remember it has units of inverse nanometers, and this side also must have units of inverse nanometers, so that, that's why the units are as funky as they are, times, and this is actually pretty damn simple, we have 1 minus 1 over n squared. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's extremely simple, so there's literally, you know, once you identify the, the general, like, um, form of the equation, whether it's, you know, proportional to n, inversely proportional to n, inversely proportional to 1 over n squared, whatever it might be. Once you get that, really the only other variable you have to throw in there is that constant. And um, the one thing to be clear, since we're trying to calculate a wavelength here, ultimately we're going to invert this whole thing. So there's one value of n that will give you uh, undefined wavelength. So when you invert the right-hand side, clearly the only thing that you can't invert is zero. So specifically, this only applies for n greater than 1, and, and it's clear that n has to be an integer. Uh, so 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, dot, dot, dot. So that's all that there is to the Lyman series. Uh, and I mean, it looks really simple, but if you are presented with a list of numbers and said, figure that formula, it's not as easy as it sounds. So let's move on to the Balmer series. Balmer series, 1 over lambda, same thing. It has that same physical constant, which this is kind of the thing that connects all of these, of course. And the only difference here is that instead of taking 1 minus 1 over n squared, now we have to take a quarter minus 1 over n squared. And again, ultimately what we, what we want to get out of this is a, is a wavelength. So once you calculate the right-hand side, then at this point we'll invert the right-hand side. So you can look at this and see pretty clearly that this breaks down for a value of n equals 2. If you take a quarter minus a quarter, you get 0, and you can't invert that. And if you take, for example, 1 quarter minus 1, you end up with a negative number, and that doesn't help us in calculating wavelengths because a uh, negative wavelength isn't a physically meaningful thing. So this is only true for n greater than 2, and strictly greater, to be clear. Now, as you might guess, the next one's going to look almost exactly the same. 1 over lambda equals Rydberg's constant, but this time, time uh, multiplied by, it's not 1 minus 1 over n squared, it's not 1 over 2 squared minus n squared, it is 1 over 3 squared, or 1 ninth minus 1 over n squared. And obviously this is only true for n greater than 3. So 
I, I think it's a really nifty kind of, you know, and it, it, I think it, you know, starting there, then going there, then going there, it makes a lot more pedagogical sense. Uh, but I think it's a really nifty kind of way to view all of this by literally you just change a constant and you get a whole separate uh, uh, spectral series. If you set that, that value there to one, the answers you get for lambda all fall in the uh, ultraviolet part. If you set that thing equal to one half squared, these all give you visible wavelengths. If you set this thing to one third squared, you get exclusively infrared wavelengths. Um, and you can probably guess what the change will be for the bracket series, the next one down the line. Uh, to produce the wavelengths for the bracket series, that you just change that one ninth to, and I'll, I'll let you figure that one out, but it's not too tough. So um, this is the, you know, where we're at. This is the mathematical predictions for all of the, the, the entirety of the, uh, the hydrogen spectrum. And Rydberg identified we can make an even more overarching predict a prediction here. Let me get a little more space. And so the Rydberg formula is basically just a way of uh, conglomerating all of these seemingly disparate but very similar formulas into one. And it's actually quite simple. One over lambda, and I'm going to put a few prefixes here, lambda n comma n prime. I don't like this notation, but I'm going to use it, uh, and it w I, I will adjust this here shortly, um, because for me, I always forget which is which, but I'll, I'll make sure I do it right. Um, so you have two separate varying indices. Think of this as like i and j, maybe, but we're going to leave it n and n prime. Equals r naught times, and you can probably guess, 1 over n squared minus 1 over n prime squared. And that's it. Now, to be clear, though, this is only, this only works when you have n prime exclusively, actually, I'll write it the other way. Uh, when you have n less than n prime. And now let's compare that there just to make sure we're sane. Uh, and, and this is why I don't love the prime and the, and the n. Um, but in this case here, if you look over here, we had, you can think of this term as 1 over 1, and this is 1 over anything greater than 1, and both are squared. And clearly here, this one is going to be greater than that one. Same thing there. In this case, for the passion series, we had n being 3. n prime is anything greater than 3. Now, my OCD is kind of hurting me a little bit here, and so just to make it entirely consistent, I am going to put n primes there. Um, now, it's, I mean, it doesn't matter, but now it actually it matches up, so, so I hope you see why I did that. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the entirety of the Rydberg formula. You can throw in, choose any integer n, 1 or anything greater. Choose any other integer greater than n. And you can predict a wavelength that hydrogen will emit, which is fantastic. So you, you, we have a single mathematical formula that agrees perfectly with experiment. And, you can, and at this point, you can predict all of these much longer wavelengths that hydrogen can actually emit, test them out, and you're right. Um, now, you get to a point where you end up with such long values of lambda. By the way, as both of these get higher and higher, um, this, this result becomes quite small. So that means that the wavelength becomes increasingly larger. And at some point, you get wavelengths that are just too long to reasonably observe. Uh, there's a physically meaningful reason why that's true as well. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. So this is the Rydberg formula, though, and this is maybe the most exciting formula about the hydrogen atom that was not due to Bohr. And I'll say more precisely, though, this is the formula that Bohr based his theory on, or at least that he should have, if he was doing it right. Um, so I'm going to pause here for a moment. So for the n and the n prime, I'm slightly confused. Um, what would we, like, call n prime to be? So, like, n would be oh. just the wave, or, like, the numbered wavelength, right? Yeah, why don't we, um, why don't I properly say this here? Um, let's identify, and this, I mentioned I don't like using these, um, the way that I would prefer to say it 
is an I, and now you might understand exactly what this means, and, oops, that square needs to go there, an F. And this, this is really how you should be thinking of it here. So th that's a really good point there. Uh, and I to, and I'm going to be even more suggestive. So one over lambda from an initial to n final. And that really should be everything that you need to deduce Bohr's formula at this point, uh, which, which is actually really cool. That once you identify instead of just a random n and n, n prime, if you physically call this ni and nf, that's, that should be enough to tell you exactly what's happening now. So d does that help a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it baffles me why no t very few textbooks use that notation. Pedagogically speaking, this is how every textbook should use it, because that's exactly what it represents. Uh, 